will talk about is more about the uh, uh, how do you make science effective, efficient when, when it comes to the relation, the partnership with the industry. Um, when energy is probably the first of the renewable energy technologies that, that sort of made it um, success story in terms of uh, development, uh, introduction, and also penetration in the market. Uh, I just took these uh, statistics here from the recent uh, uh, statistics issued by Global Energy Council. It shows that, that uh, uh, this technology has been growing for the last uh, 25 years, reaching <coughs> out at about uh, uh, 240 gigawatt, uh, an increase of 20% last year. Uh, and you see it's still growing, although the rate of growth perhaps has uh, dropped a bit due to financial crisis. But considering Considering the financial crisis is really quite remarkable, and it's a global uh, penetration, it happens all over the world. And together with that, you can see quite a, 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 a rapid development of this technology, went to a capacity 100 times what it had uh, 25 years ago. Uh, so, in a way, this is a, a success of the partnership between science and, and, uh, and industry. Science and followed. Uh, be interested from the very start after the energy crisis and big services. Um, so one can argue that wind energy is really a, a science-based uh, technology. But I actually would like to put a question mark there. Uh, the slide here shows uh, 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 the way we look at it, or at least some people look at it in Denmark, namely that wind energy has a long history, and we, uh, electricity producing uh, uh, wind energy has a long history. Um, in Denmark, it started way back in uh, more than 100 years ago with um, uh, some attestation and some science carried out uh, at, a, at a public high school. Uh, and as you see, uh, it was actually quite advanced. It had a wind tunnel tester, worked with a speed control, etc. And, and one, one could argue that uh, what you see today, uh, a modern wind turbine, 6 megawatt, uh, 75 meters. Made specifically tailored air force, uh, uh, power converters, uh, condition monitoring, uh, uh, all kinds of interesting electronics and, and, um, and uh, IT being involved is, is a, a uh, consequence of that. Uh, but I, I would very much put a question mark to the idea that, that uh, science uh, evolves uh, uh, linearly, that you have a, a scientific idea that's being developed that finally reaches the marketplace. That's not really the way it works. At least it has in Denmark. Uh, if you, again, go back to, to the history in, in, in Denmark, yeah, it's true we had a, a development 100 years ago. It was part of the electrification of the rural areas. And these machines were, were producing DC, and there were even uh, uh, developments of, of uh, hydrogen storage. And it all disappeared after the first world war, when the diesel engine came around, and it would start getting oil. Then uh, around the Second World War, it appeared again. In the meantime, a lot of the knowledge was lost, but it appeared again, and it uh, ended with the gas wind turbine that was put out in '57. Then it, it disappeared, <coughs> and the reason, of course, was cheap oil. And then, in the end of the '70s, with the energy crisis, it started up. Again. And um, what that really shows is that it's not a linear process. It's not such a, a great scientific idea. Uh, slowly grow into a, a, a technology. It's in fact much more complicated. It's, it's, if you want to describe the processes, the process of interaction between many factors. You have governments, you have energy systems, you have uh, competing technologies. And if science wants to, to support this development and accelerate the development, it has to be quite flexible in, in the way it interacts with industry. Uh, I've tried to, to illustrate that a bit uh, from uh, the develop, development that I know of from, from the, our national lab and our university. Well, we started in 79 with what we call the concept development. And actually, they have very little to do with, with basic research. It's more what we call uh, innovation, working with the uh, uh, proving that, that uh, these critters actually could produce electricity. The next step was a step not of science, really, but of documenting the performance of, of, uh, of so you had a lot of testing, you created the uh, design basic fundamental requirements and um, uh, in Denmark we had a system, approval system that sort of uh, 
work as a quality assurance. Uh, you can say that the innovation then was uh, supplemented with uh, some public sector support, because it was on behalf of the government and, and the uh, government supplying subsidies that, that most of these things happened. But of course, uh, we did a little bit of research to, to, to do that. Then came period of uh, development of this technology. And now we see research coming in. Uh, and uh, try to reapply research, um, resulting design tools and uh, resource mapping and, and standardization started at that time. And uh, now we are in what we call an in industrial phase where, where um, suddenly science becomes far more fundamental. It's not good enough to, to, to use what you have and combine it. With you. In fact, have to do some fairly fundamental science in order to, to advance the technology. And the tools become more refined, you integrate, and, uh, and you, tend, you start to validate not only uh, uh, the turbines, but also the various uh, the components. And you see investments uh, like wind tunnels, uh, drive fin test fields, uh, facilities, etc. Et and uh, you also see things like patents. And now education being one of the ways that science interacts with the, with the industry. So I'll give you some examples of, on, on, the, the, on how uh, we, we interact uh, at present in Denmark. Uh, but before that, uh, just want to illustrate this development by, by uh, how the standards I have developed. It's really the same picture that these are the international standards, so they're like five years behind uh, the national standards. But it starts with fundamental uh, functional and safety requirements. Then you start to document, you develop test standards. Uh, it becomes more mature. Uh, you want to, to give the technology credibility, so you start with having a third party verification and certification. And finally, uh, uh, they become an industry product and interfaces and, um, and component standards being developed. So there is a, 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 a development, the needs uh, from the industry and the, and the challenges, the science changes with time. So I'll give you some examples. Uh, one of the uh, scientific areas has to do with, with uh, uh, fluids, fluid mechanics, fluid flows. And in order to understand uh, the wind energy, uh, that is a, a, uh, an area where a lot of research is carried out, both with flow into rain, uh, uh, behind turbine, uh, baits, uh, Etc. Etc. Um, and all of these models give you an understanding, but they are not really there uh, when it comes to tools helping the industry in their product development. Uh, for that, you need a different kind of tools. And uh, this is just an example. This is a code that uh, we have developed uh, at our place uh, that can calculate loads for a number of different wind turbine configurations. Uh, the point simply is that in order to, to transfer, in order to interact with the industry, you need to take it one step further from the, the more fundamental research and actually uh, implement, implement it in, in, in packages that, are, uh, that the industry can use. In this case, a computer code that can use for the design of the wind turbine, a computer code that at the same time uh, uh, works as a knowledge platform for our research where all new research results are, are being put in. So codes can be a very, very efficient way of, of transferring. Um, another uh, area where, where science makes a difference, uh, that's uh, with experiments, with measurements. And uh, in this case, uh, it was a full-scale uh, test on a very large two megawatt wind turbine doing pressure tests and, and other flow measurements. Uh, the amazing thing here is perhaps not that we could do that, they just could, uh, but perhaps the, the consortium behind such a, a, a test where you see several competitors and energy company and the research working together to, to provide that kind of verification. Um, another extremely important area at the moment, that's wake effects, because you put wind turbines on the wind farm so the turbines interact. And uh, the, the picture uh, of the wind farm below shows a, an offshore wind farm under the right conditions where, where the uh, waves cause compensation. So you can see the waves, and you can see it's very, very complex flow. Um, but it's this kind of complex flow that decides the load and performance of wind farms. So it's very important, really. And you can study that using large computer models, like uh, uh, 
large scale simulation models where uh, we spend a week uh, analyzing a couple of uncertainties standing together. Interesting, you get understanding, but it doesn't really help you very much when it comes to, to supporting and accelerating the, the industrial development. So you need to do something else. Um, and one of the things is to, again, to, to make what we call engineering models. In this case, we have made an a, a alternative model where you actually, instead of describing the full flow, you uh, describe the, the wake effects as a wake that meanders with a low frequency part of turbulence. And uh, the rest here is really just a, a showing that this model actually works quite well, works quite well in uh, comparing uh, fatigue flows, works quite well in other fatigue flows, works quite well when uh, predicting the power output, works quite well when, when you look at the various wakes and uh, look around the wind farm. But it's much more efficient, it's much uh, better for, for as a design tool. Uh, another um, Two is, uh, uh, is for predicting the, the performance of wind farm and the waves between wind turbines and behind wind farms. Uh, again, you can use uh, uh, the more uh, uh, recently developed uh, uh, large scale CFD models, but uh, uh, you always have to, to run for a week in order to, uh, to analyze one direction. So you have to develop something else. In our case, we have developed a much faster CFD model that allows you to, to analyze this in much much faster. And it works actually just as well as the more comprehensive part of it. It's of course very uh, satisfying to the researchers um, and, uh, and also showed that these emissions are taken from wind farm in, in various directions and it showed that the model actually works very well indeed. Uh, but my main point is, is not well, something we're bragging about or not, but but, but uh, we need this kind of next step um, from basic science to, to industry where, where you prepare your scientific results in a way that they are easily used by the industry. Um, visuality. Uh, having business case certainty means that you have to be very sure about uh, uh, how much you produce with a wind turbine. It has been our uh, part of our work for, for many, many years to prepare what we call wind atlases, maps of wind resources. And we have developed some pretty fundamental uh, uh, models that are being used all over the world for, for predicting how much the wind turbine inside uh, would produce. Uh, that develops, of course, and, and one of the big challenges in, at the moment that is complex terrain. Uh, complex terrain is complex, meaning that a, uh, a simple measurements will not describe the terrain. And even when you use the uh, uh, advanced uh, CFD flow models, then uh, uh, you occasionally get some very nasty surprises. So what can science do about that? Well, what we did a couple of years ago was to carry out a, uh, a uh, experiment at a small island in Denmark that had uh, more or less kind of shapes that, that you see in, in uh, many uh, installations in, in the world. A steep escarpment where on top of that you usually put your wind turbines. And we used that, we took a data set, and then we had a blind test where we invited a lot of people to, uh, to analyze uh, uh, the flow around this island. And uh, we put a mask out at a number and total of 10 miles and measured in a, in a uh, couple of miles. And what came out of that when we were compared? Well, basically you see that the models uh, they at least show the right behavior, but it's actually quite a large difference between the models. And um, in particular, if you look at, uh, at um, the wind is coming from, uh, from this side, uh, and then the first peak you see that that's on top of the escarpment. And that's why you typically would put a, a, a wind turbine if you can complex terrain. And as you see, they, they disagree quite a bit about, uh, about uh, how much flow you have there. And um, if you sort of try to, to uh, quantify the error, calculate the mean error from the measure, you can search 
the uh, flow result, you find something like 20% 20, 20 of mean error, which is actually quite a lot when you're talking immunity. Um, so there's something to be done here. And again, science can help you. What we are doing that right now is to continue analyzing such uh, flows. And uh, one of our major activities at the moment, that's what we call the wind scan. That's a LiDAR system where you can uh, uh, control the beams. So you can take three beams, focus on a point, get all three uh, components of the wind, and then move the beams and, and uh, scan the wind fields. Uh, we used a single one of those to, to measure the same situation. Instead of having mass, we put this wind scan out and then uh, uh, carried out measurement at uh, a number of stations, created sort of a, a virtual mast and measured there. And what came out in, in half a day's measurement compared to several months using mast was these uh, prof profiles, as you see there in the bottom. Uh, the uh, simple one is the one of the undisturbed flow. Uh, and then if you go in uh, further in, uh, on the island, you see uh, the, uh, how the flow the profile is distorted. And you see you even have some uh, uh, adverse flow, uh, you have a, a separation. So, so by having such a, an advanced uh, new instrument and, and new technology, you can actually study these things to a much better, higher degree. And, uh, use this to improve your models in, in a way that uh, simple measurements would never do. In fact, it's not only profiles you can analyze. You can also go one step further because it's this kind of instrument really quite fast. It scans like uh, 390 uh, uh, scans a second. So you can actually measure turbulence. And, and the, uh, the figure up there shows what are these artificial mass positions, the wind speed. And you can actually see uh, that you have very turbulence, but you also have this uh, uh, reverse flow in, in the bottom. And uh, if you scale it up, that is what two can it be where you put a wind So, uh, so uh, this kind of, it just shows that you have to be careful and if you are not. And you may find some very high loads of wind turbulence. But again, this is state of the art equipment, the state of the art measurements, and uh, it's really quite interesting work for everybody there. Today you are able to do this kind of of uh, experiment. Yeah, I think I skipped that because it just shows. Uh, an interesting thing now is that uh, uh, you sort of reverse a bit with with offshore because what happens in, in offshore is that that uh, the game is open again. So all this maturity uh, in, in uh, uh, is lost. But what you see is that uh, you start from scratch again offshore uh, with a number of different concepts. And uh, suddenly the game is, is different. What, uh, this uh, vertical axis uh, uh, to the right is actually a project that, that we are carrying out at the moment, uh, investigating how such a floating concept can work. Not to develop it into a product as such, but to investigate the concept. So you're actually back to what we did in, in the early ages when it comes to, uh, to, to offshore. Uh, it will, will not take 30 years because the tools have been proved much. But it just shows that, that uh, science has to, <coughs> to work in different manners. And uh, this is also illustrated by the Danish strategy for the development of offshore. Uh, you may not be able to read all, all of it, but as you can see, uh, much of that has very little to do with science. It has a lot to do with innovation, it has a lot to do with new approaches to things. But, uh, but, uh, we start with, with actually with innovation, not with science. And that also reflects on the way that uh, we operate. Uh, uh, I used to be uh, heading a large department at the National Lab. Now I'm heading a, an institute of a university. Uh, and um, uh, the reason is not that, that uh, research innovation is not important, but the reason is really that in order to have an impact with your research, this point in time, you need to use your knowledge and, and, and uh, transfer it through education. And that suddenly means that the uh, 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 research on we need to, uh, can be much more effective in the context of the university than in the case of, of, uh, of the national lab. I'm sure Dan would disagree with me, but, but, uh, but it actually turns out that that's, that is a, a quite powerful combination, at least in Denmark. So in order to have an impact, or, or 
to be, for, for science to be effective, you need quality, uh, good research, you need to have relevance, meaning that you have to be the use research, have a strategic research program, uh, attack the problems on different levels, and it's quite new that you, you uh, also have more fundamental way in your research, not only for dealing with technology and systems. And finally, that you need various instruments to bring science out to work, to develop the technology. So, conclusions, uh, I, I think you noticed uh, with the development of radiology that actually 90% of the uh, installation took have been uh, within the last 10 years. And this development has taken 30 years. So even though you have a technology that has roots long back, the introduction of a new uh, energy technology takes time. And that's important to know, because we are not solved in, in the next 10 years by technologies that we don't know about today. It takes time. Uh, one should also know that uh, you have to work with the industry. Development actually happens with it in the industry. It's a bottom-up process, and you need to support and accelerate that. You cannot really initiate. Um, it's a partnership, and you need to adapt. And um, you need to have the appropriate mechanisms for, for your for interacting with with the industry, uh, which in our case means not only innovation and, and uh, consulting, but also education. That's uh, one of the primary. So I think that those were my words, so thank you for your attention.